What position battles will be the most interesting as we move into the spring and fall for TCU football and TCU basketball? Woof. Tough loss to Baylor last night at home. Just could not find a way to get going on offense. All that coming up next here on Locked On Horn Frogs. It's your team every day. You are Locked On Horn Frogs. Your daily podcast on the TCU Horn Frogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Locked on Horn Frogs, your team every day. I'm your host, Stephen Simcox. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. We're free and available wherever you get your podcast. So if you like to just listen to podcasts the old fashioned way, the old timey way, get your family together, huddle around the phone like they huddle around the radio in a movie when the president's addressing the nation, then you can subscribe on your favorite podcast app as well. We're doing this five days a week, talking to TCU Athletics. We're going to start with football today. I love it when you guys chime in with questions. It doesn't even have to necessarily be about the topic that I was presenting yesterday. We let off with basketball, and we talked a lot of hoops as the men's team had a nice win against Cincy on Saturday. Unfortunately, they fall to Baylor 62-54 to on Monday night in that big Monday matchup. But in the course of that video, also touched on football as well. And one of our frequent listeners or contributors, Tanner McKinney, he asked me, what football position battle do you think could be the most challenging? So I'm assuming, Tanner, that what you're asking is which one will be the most challenging for the coaching staff to evaluate where it's going to be tougher than to make a decision. So I have one on offense and one on defense. I feel like both are going to be interesting or challenging for these coaches. On the offensive side of the ball, I really don't think there's a battle at quarterback. As always, feel free to disagree with me. You can tweet at me, at Steven. You can chime in on the YouTube uh, comment thread there. But I was asked about this on the radio yesterday, actually. I was on the radio in Waco with uh, Ward Whites. He has a midday show. And he asked me about the QB situation. And I ran down, you know, you got Haas Haney coming in from Alito. I think he's going to be a great player for TCU, but I don't expect him to start immediately. Maybe he'll have some sort of special package that he'll be involved in to especially use what he can do with his legs. Ken Seals coming over from Vandy, who made, I believe, 22 starts in the SEC, or at his time in Vandy, made 22 career starts, the majority of those coming in SEC play. And, of course, Josh Hoover is the incumbent who took over last year. And it's possible that I'm underestimating – Ken Seals. But I really, my read on this is, I'm sure Ken would disagree, but my read on the situation is that Ken Seals is in the era of the transfer portal. There is now a demand for experienced backup quarterbacks. Similar to in the NFL, you might see like when Andy Dalton signed with the Cowboys a few years back, right? He wasn't taking Dak Prescott's place, but that was just insurance for if Dak Prescott got hurt. And each year you see journeyman quarterbacks, whether it's guys that have been around the league for a long time, like Luke McCown, or guys that didn't work out at their current stop, like Joe Flacco, you know, thing Lamar Jackson takes over in Baltimore. He's bounced around a couple different places with the Jets, saw some success with the Browns last year. But you want to have somebody that's a break glass in case of emergency player So if your starter goes down, you feel comfortable. Okay, we have somebody who can at least understand the offense, run it efficiently, do some good things, make some plays, and we're going to be limited, but not as limited as we could be. And also just a good presence to have in the locker room, somebody that can be a sounding board for the other quarterbacks. And because now in college football, everybody wants to play, especially QBs, because there's only one guy on the field at a time. For these young players, if they don't get playing time quickly, then oftentimes you'll see them move on to another place because they want to play, which is understandable. And so Ken Seals is a player who's had experience at the SEC level. He's coming closer to home now. I don't think he's going to be – I mean, he's a competitor. He wants to play. But I don't feel like he's just going to up and leave if he doesn't win the job. But he's there if you need him. And I feel like it's Josh Hoover's job to lose is probably the best way to put it. Unless things just unravel – in spring camp or fall camp, or unless Ken Seals or Haas Haney plays so well that the coaching staff is forced to make a decision, Josh is going to be your quarterback in 2024. At the running back position, I think it's an interesting situation, but I feel like your every down back is going to be Cam Cook to start the season. That's subject to change if they bring in a running back after spring ball. But I think most likely if they did bring in somebody after spring ball, it would be more of a third down back, change of pace type of guy. And they have a couple of those players already with Trey Sanders. Trent Battle, 
Corey Wren. At wide receiver, I don't really feel like there's much of a battle. I think J.P. Richardson's going to be in your inside receiver. Eric McAllister's going to be on the outside. I know some people think Dalen Wright can make a push for that spot. I feel like Dalen Wright's going to be a factor in this offense, but I don't believe he'll be a starter. And then Savion Williams on the outside. On the other side, Drake Nabney will be your starting tight end. So the battle on offense that I am most intrigued by, or I think is actually going to be a real deal battle, is on the offensive line. And it's not so much certain spots as much as it is which five players are Sunday Dykes and A.J. Ricker going to come to a consensus on as the leaders up front. You got Colton Deary, who played some last year. Will he get reps at center? Bless Harris, a transfer from Florida State. I think he's going to be your left tackle. A couple guys that they brought from group of five schools, you know, Carson Bruno, Cade Bennett, that could slide into the interior and play well. Remington Strickland is a, a guy that's been um, in, in the two deep at Texas A&M for a few years. He's coming over. Mike Nichols is a... a player that has experience and I think he has the inside track for that other tackle position. Ben Taylor Whitfield played a lot of snaps last year for the frogs. Are there any young guys that could emerge? And the ultimate wild card to me is Tommy Brockermeyer, former number two player in the country when he was in high school. Hasn't really worked out so far because of injuries, had a back injury last season, had to have surgery. I'm skeptical that he'll be ready to go to start the year. Or I think he'll be ready to go. I'm just not sure if he'll be ready to step in and be a starter immediately. But if he's at full strength, I mean, he's a special talent. He's got the frame. He's got the size. He showed the ability in high school. So I think he could be a factor in this decision as well. Robbie Rochester is another name, the transfer from UConn. They've got some different options. Now, sometimes those linemen by committee situations, probably not the right term for it, but if you feel like you have a lot of options, that can mean one of two things. Maybe you have depth or maybe you just have a lot of guys that are just sort of there. Is anybody going to step up and take over? The The players that I feel best about starting at the moment are Colton Deary at center and then Bless Harris at one of those tackle spots. I think you can pretty much etch that in unless something goes wrong. I feel like the other three positions are going to be subject to change and how quickly they can, can they come together and have some continuity. But I'm hoping that this year up front they will be better just in general overall, and that's going to unlock a new aspect of this offense that you know they can run the ball more effectively. Because late last season they really turned into a true A-raid team, and I think part of it was – that's kind of what Josh Hoover is comfortable with. So I feel like those concepts are going to be part of the system as long as he's back there taking snaps with the shotgun. But the other factor simply was, I just don't think they trusted their O-line to get pushed consistently and run the football. And so when you can't do that, you become a pretty one-dimensional team. And if you're a one-dimensional team on offense, it's tough to be efficient and score, especially in the red zone when the field shrinks and it's, it's harder to get guys open and teams can kind of bracket wide receivers and tight ends better. They don't have to worry about getting beat over the top. And so it's more difficult to find ways to throw the football effectively. Um, and it's tougher to run too. And so if you're already not a good running team, then it can be hard to find openings and space in the rushing attack down near the goal line. So I think on offense, O-line is where you need to look. If you're talking about position battles, and it's not really one specific position. It's just like, okay, who are the five guys that they're going to roll with this upcoming season? And what is that group going to look like? How cohesive can they be when the season gets going? And how quickly can this offense get to a place where they are just better overall? Defensively, I feel like the most interesting battle is going to be at linebacker. One, just because you have a, a good number of options here. But secondly, with a new system, these guys are going to be asked to do different things. So you have Shad Banks, who's returning and has played a lot of snaps for the last few years. Johnny Hodges is also coming back, and he's been a starter at times, dealt with injuries last season. The big name to know that came in, though, is Kaylee Belarms Orr, the transfer from Cal. And I feel like he's going to be, you know, a day one starter on this defense at one of those inside linebacker spots. Namdi Obizor, I believe he's going to be a starter. He led the team in tackles last year. He said media availability recently. But he's moving to the same linebacker position. He feels comfortable with that. So Orr and Obizor, but then that those other spots are kind of up for grabs. And you have a new stud linebacker position now, which is sort of a hybrid outside linebacker defensive end spot. You're going to be asked to rush the passer. You'll also be asked at times 
to drop back into coverage to do different things. So what is that going to look like? Um, Devin Deal is a name that comes to mind. He played in a similar position at Tulane. Uh, could it be, you know, Johnny Hodges has been a name that's thrown out there, even though I think Johnny is an effective blitzer. I feel like pass rushing is a different skill set, and I, I think that's going to be tough for him to, to make that transition. But maybe he's somebody that they look at as well. Uh, Cooper McDonald from San Diego State will be coming in, and he played in a similar position for the Aztecs. So that's those are names to know. And, and there's some other fascinating players there that can they find a way to contribute. Marcel Brooks, I, I love the guy, and I hope he stays healthy. Um, I'm not really sure what you can expect from him at this point just because this is year three of – us saying, okay, can Marcel Brooks be an X factor in this defense? And, and it just keeps coming back to one, can you find a place for him to be effective on the field? You know, what position can he play? What can he do well? And then secondly, can he hold up physically? But when we're talking about a defense that brings pressure from different angles and wants to be aggressive, a guy like Marcel Brooks with his athleticism, it, it seems like that would be a good fit for him. Um so, you know, do any of these other guys step up? Terrence Cooks is a name um, that a couple of years ago, that was kind of one of their big transfer players they're excited about and hasn't really uh, come to fruition on the field. That's another guy to know. A lot of different options at that linebacker spot. You know, elsewhere, D-line I think will also be fascinating because you've got a good mix of young guys and, and some vets that you brought in through the portal who will emerge there, and you, you have a defensive line now that should be put in better situations to make plays and be aggressive, and so that's encouraging for this team as that was not part of the defense the last few seasons. I think in the secondary, things are a little more set, but you do have a number of corners and, and safeties that you brought in recently after Andy Avalos took the job, and different defense coordinator means you know different priorities, different things that he's looking for. So to answer your question on the defensive side, um, Tanner, I really think all those positions might be up for grabs. The, the most interesting to me is linebacker. But I think you, you're coming into a situation uh, where there's kind of a clean slate because this D.C. hasn't seen these guys in action. He wants to know, all right, what you know, who fits this system, who's doing what we ask him to do and can pick up the, the verbiage and – um, the responsibilities quickly in a way that we can hit the ground running and not make a lot of mistakes to start the season. So some really intriguing things. This is a critical off season for this team and this program. You want to get those positive vibes back. I think you have an opportunity with the schedule to win between eight to 10 games and you need to take that step forward. If you're Sonny Dykes and this coaching staff, when we come back, I was excited about last night. I thought it was a big opportunity for the frogs. They couldn't capitalize. They lose 62 to 54 to Baylor. We'll talk about that and more next on Locked On. Horn Frogs, your team every day. FanDuel, they have great deals going on all the time, and they are still being very generous with this promotion. New customers, $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. You simply go to fanduel.com slash locked on, sign up, make a $1 $5 bet, not a huge investment. If you win that bet, you get $150 in bonus bets. NBA's in full swing right now, so they're really pushing that. If you, It's a perfect time if you're a hoop head to start betting. They have quick bets, same game parlays, exclusive props, and more. Mavs are catching fire, even though they lost to the Pacers on Sunday. That, that stunk. But they're playing better. Games every night. MLB's right around the corner. College football, pro football over-unders. It's all happening. FanDuel.com slash locked on. One $5 bet. One $5 winning bet gets you $150 in bonus bets. Again, that's fanduel.com slash locked on. Download the app or go to that website. Win one $5 bet, get $150 in bonus bets. FanDuel, official betting partner of the NBA and proud sponsor of the Locked On Network. I pride myself on this show. I try to be pretty level headed. I'm not hot take guy. It's just not who I am. Now, I have strong opinions about things, but especially when it comes to like basketball, baseball, I'm reacting to individual games multiple times a week. I don't like to fly off the handle. I try to stay pretty measured. Sometimes my locked-on bosses give me a hard time. They're like, hey, we need you to have stronger opinions. You got you to gotta get clicks. You got to put the headlines out there. They're going to make people 
oh man, what does he have to say today? But you know, I, I just I, I try to make an effort to keep things in perspective. I think I owe it to you guys as listeners and viewers. And I know everybody's passionate and, and you're fans, and I'm a fan, but I try not to make these bold proclamations, whether it's good or bad. But last night, listen, losing to Baylor basketball is not a bad loss. Baylor's a really good team. They got a couple of potential NBA lottery picks on their roster. Um, Jacoby Walter is a great player. He's an outstanding freshman. Jay Nunn's great. Meese's a big presence inside. Jalen Bridges has a ton of experience. The list goes on. Good team. TC went down there into Waco, won that ball game in triple overtime. One of the best moments of the year. But I don't understand. This we're going on year three or four of this. When I was a student a decade ago, the other day I was joking around with my buddy or I was talking with a friend about like rent prices for apartments, right? He lives in Fort Worth. And I was like, man, you know, my friends and I, we paid this much for a duplex. And I was talking about it like it was a couple of years ago. And then in my mind, I was like, oh no, that was a decade ago. I'm old. And those of you that are older than me, I'm sorry. But I, I just, I felt really old in that moment talking about that. But when I was there, basketball program was bad. There was not much of an atmosphere. You know, I was one of the few people that showed up in the student section team. It was hard to support the team at times because they were struggling so much. But I made an effort to be there. They did not have, I mean, the home court advantage did not exist. The university, the students have worked really hard to make Shalemar Arena a place where it's tough to play. And the environment last night was great. And I don't know why, but it feels like every time in the past few seasons that TCU basketball hypes up a big game, that they make a big push to get people in the seats. And I I don't disparage them for doing this. Like, I love the idea. You want people there. Jamie Dixon and the crew, they did a couple fun, funny videos. They did like a mock sports center commercial with Super Frog, who was dreaming about Big Monday. Jeremiah Donati, the AD, was out there giving money to students. Like, he was doing cool promotions. He was greeting students at the door hours before. I love it. It's great. But then you go out and you lose and you have just, just bad effort. And I don't understand. And it's not the first time it's happened. You know, earlier this year against Texas, Barstool TCU had a really cool idea. They're going to buy a bunch of horns down shirts, right? Because it was coming off, you know, um, Rodney Terry complaining about UCF and giving the horn down signal after that loss. It was coming off the BYU student section had some horns down shirts or signs or something. And they were asked to, take that down. It was a good bit and great atmosphere for that Texas game. Saturday afternoon team gets off to a great start, but they fade down the stretch and they end up losing. And last night lost, you know, a couple of years ago against Texas seemed like they made a huge effort to get people in the stands and they were there and then they just couldn't find a way to win. Uh, in this ball game offensively just struggled mightily. Baylor came out and played zone and TCU did not have an answer. Now, this is a better shooting team than they have been the last couple of years, but Trey Tennyson is the key. If he's not shooting from the outside, then you know you might get a, an occasional hot night from Micah Peavy from beyond the arc. Jameer Nelson Jr. is about a 25% three-point shooter. Avery Anderson around the same. Tennyson's the key, though, and he is just going through a rough cold stretch right now. He's over, He was 0 for 8 last night, 0 for 5 from 3. Had a couple that rimmed out. But he's your zone buster. He's the guy that's going to get them extended and maybe force them to change their hand a little bit. He couldn't do it. And then also, I just didn't think they were active enough. They weren't patient enough. They weren't moving around enough. You have to move the ball and not just around the perimeter against the zone. You have to get the ball to the free throw line. You got to move it to the corner. It's, it's just the ball's got to move. And I felt like they got too complacent and just passing the ball around the perimeter and settling for shots that weren't quality. But in the first half, they kind of hung around. Uh, Jameer Nelson Jr. had a great dunk on Misi. You know, both teams went through a horrible scoring drought for like the last 10 minutes of the first half. But you're down 25-23 at halftime. It's like, okay, you didn't play great, but you're right there. You come out in the second half and just get your doors blown off. I mean, it was a 17-point lead at one point, maybe an 18-point lead as well. TCU made a couple pushes at various times in the second half, but they were never in that ball game, and it was just a rough night from the jump offensively. Um, Emmanuel Miller or Jameer Nelson Jr. led the way with 11 points, but it was on three of eight shooting. Emmanuel Miller had 10. Those were the only two guys in double digits. 26% from three, 
33% from the field. Just a rough night all around. They played pretty well defensively. I mean, it's a Baylor team that can score. They held them to 62 points. Ernest Uday was out again. I thought Misi was going to dominate. He ended up having 16 points in 21 minutes. But a lot of that was in the second half when they had to go small because of some foul trouble. I thought overall they did a pretty good job against him. Jalen Bridges got off to a hot start. He was hitting threes uh, left and right, and that got Baylor out to a lead early in that ball game. But, man, it's just one of those things. Like, this is not a bad loss in a vacuum. Baylor's top 15 team in the country. I understand it. But I just felt like this was a big opportunity at home. Baylor's coming off an overtime loss to Houston. They had lost two in a row. They were desperate. But I feel like TCU could have matched their desperation with help from the crowd, with help from that atmosphere against a team that you would think would have tired legs. Now, TCU played Saturday as well, but they got a pretty comfortable win against Cincinnati. And it's just the the constant frustration with this era of basketball under Jamie Dixon where they're, they're good, but the, the consistency is just not there night in and night out. It's a brutal league. It is. It's tough. The Big 12 is a tough conference. But you're 8-7 and seven now. You go on the road to Provo on Saturday night. BYU has been almost unbeatable at home. If you drop that game, then you're 500 in conference play with two games to go against West Virginia and UCF. Um, And it just felt like if you were going to get to 10 or 11 wins in conference play, this was a game you had to have, and you just couldn't do it. And and the discussion always kind of comes back with with this team right now. And, you know, Jamie and what kind of job is he doing coaching? Jamie has raised the level of this program – so much like he has he's built something great here and I think he's getting some momentum in recruiting and you know you lost some important players from last season in some ways this felt like it was going to be a rebuilding year but man there were this was a chance to go get a victory against a really good team sweep the season series against Baylor and you just couldn't do it didn't love the effort didn't love um, you know, especially offensively, just could not find a way to answer that zone. And this, you know, we saw this earlier in the year with like teams pressuring TCU's guards. Texas kind of gave them the blueprint and then it continued. They've done better about it lately at times, not turning the ball over. A lot of lazy passes yesterday that led to turnovers. But now you wonder, okay, are teams just gonna run zone until you show that you can beat it. I mean, I mean that's a smart strategy. Like if I'm BYU, I'm watching that tape this week. I'm like, yeah, we're coming out in the zone, and you got to force us out of it because they did not have an answer for it on Monday night. And the good news is you get a few days of practice here before you have to go play on Saturday. But tough loss for the Frogs um, as they fall to eight and seven in conference play. When we come back, we'll talk about uh, TC baseball back in action tonight. In a midweek affair, busy week for uh, the Frogs baseball team. So we'll get into that next. It's Locked on Horn Frogs. It's your team, and we do it here every day. You're listening to this or watching this because you love sports. And if you love sports, you probably like to go to games. And you're always wondering, what's the best place to get tickets? Because there's so many options now. Game time is the best place for you to get tickets. Go to game time. It's an app. You get it down on your phone. Download the app. I don't know why I said it like that. You, you know what apps are. Download the app on your phone. Use the code Locked On for $20 off. One great thing about the Game Time app, they show you exactly what your view is going to be from your, your seat. You see a picture, you know exactly what your view is going to be from your seat. You also, there's no hidden fees. It tells you exactly what the total is going to be when you click on the tickets. $20 off your first purchase with that promo code Locked On. It's not just sporting events. They also have, um, Tickets for concerts, comedy shows, everything you would need. Game time app. Use promo code locked on for $20 off. Best place to get tickets for whatever event you're interested in. TCU baseball plays Washington State tonight at 6 p.m. Then they get Arizona tomorrow at 6 p.m. Both games will be on ESPN Plus. And then this weekend they play uh USC twice at Globe Life Field on Friday and Sunday. And in between that, they have a matchup with Arizona State on Saturday at Globe Life Field. So busy week for the Frogs. But talking about the midweek games, tonight against Washington State, Ben Hampton expected to be the starter. TBA on the starter for Arizona, you'd think it's going to be mostly a bullpen game. But I'd be interested to see if Luis Rodriguez is the guy that gets the nod. Had a lot of starts last year. Didn't pitch this past weekend. So he should be well-rested and available for that game against Arizona. Um, 
We'll also see if Peyton Tolley's back in the lineup tonight. He missed the Saturday and Sunday games against UCLA. And Jamie Plunkett, you know, went to the media availability after the, that series. And Kirk Sarloos kind of downplayed it and was like, yeah, we're just trying to get his timing right, get him in a good place mentally before we put him back out there. I do wonder, and, and we'll see how it plays out. I think Peyton was – he was a great two-way player at Wichita State. And we've seen players at the college level, you know, pitch and hit effectively. It's not like it hasn't been done before. Obviously, Shohei Otani is doing it in Major League Baseball, but that dude's an alien. So I, I don't really think there's a lot that we can take from, from what he does because it doesn't seem like something that a lot of people can replicate. But it's still a big ask. I mean, if you're talking about somebody being a Friday night starter and also being in the middle of your lineup, it's a tough thing. He's also adjusting to just – New school, new place, new team, all those things. So hopefully he's in a better headspace and they can help coach him through this. Um, but, yeah, hasn't been available the last two times out. So I'll be interested to see what he looks like or if he plays in these midweek games and then going into the weekend. So big week for TCU baseball. Ben Hampton on the mound tonight and then TBA tomorrow. We'll be back tomorrow. It's Locked on Horn Frogs. It's your team, and we do it here every day.